Well, our scripture reading for this morning, I would like to share with you a reading from Acts chapter 2, and I'll begin reading at the 42nd verse. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God. And having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. Now, contrary to what I have observed is the general opinion from many Christians about the book of Revelation, there are, in fact, in the book of Revelation, many glorious scenes Heavenly scenes, praise scenes, scenes of victory and salvation. And it's important for us to remember when we contemplate the book of Revelation that John was writing what Jesus himself wanted to say to persecuted Christians in the late first century in the context of the discussion about end times, but his immediate audience was persecuted Christians to give them hope, to give them strength, knowing what they were going through. And in chapter 7 of the book of Revelation, we first see a description of the remnant of God's chosen people, the Jewish people, who will be saved in the end times from each tribe. But then, in addition to this, this is what was revealed to John. Listen to what he wrote. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. What John was trying to communicate, what Jesus was trying to communicate through John was listen to all you Christians, you first century Christians, I know that you're being persecuted. I know that there are among you many who are being martyred, family members, members of your church, best friends. But... Your sacrificial ministry. Look at the results. Look at this multitude of people who are going to be saved, who are going to be part of the eternal kingdom. So stay faithful. Stay in there. Don't give up. Because look at the results. Now you see, Jesus, before he was ascended, he told his disciples what the mission was to be. And you're well familiar with this. He says, to go into all the world and to do what? Make disciples. Not just signing up people for an organization, but to make disciples of Jesus. To baptize them. To teach them everything that he taught. Now the fact that you're all sitting here is a testimony to the fact that somebody told you. <laughs> Think back. Think back in your life journey of those people who poured into you, who shared the gospel with you the first time and maybe the second time, the hundredth time, until you got to the point where you yourself made your confession of faith in Jesus Christ. Can you see their faces? Do you remember them? Do you hear their voices? The mission of the church through good times and through very, very bad times has always been the same. 
to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Christ. And this vision of revelation is the result of that faithful witness. Now, when I was a youngster and I was compelled to go to the church by my parents, praise God, but at the time, I really did not have a sense of the larger purpose of the church. But now that I've I had the opportunity by the Holy Spirit teaching me, Stephen, do you see the larger vision of what I'm trying to do? It isn't just about you going to church. It's about that vision revelation to reach God's people with the gospel. Now, our scripture reading from, for today from Acts 2 has sometimes been referred to, or this, at least the chapter 2, as the Holy Spirit chapter. Because if you'll recall, this is the chapter that begins with Pentecost, which we're going to be celebrating in a few weeks, and we'll make a big deal of, out of it then. And what happened at Pentecost was that the, the, the people were empowered, the disciples uh, were empowered by the Holy Spirit to fulfill Christ's command. They were given the gift of being able to speak in different languages so they can go to other places and communicate the gospel to people who didn't necessarily speak the language of those in Jerusalem. And then after that, we have Peter's sermon, this magnificent sermon, where at the conclusion of that sermon, 3,000 people came to faith and were baptized. We've got a challenge. I mean, that's, that's preaching for you right there. Then one sermon getting 3,000 people to come to faith. But that's what happened when the Spirit got a hold of Peter and got a hold of the people. Well, then the chapter ends with a description of these first Christians, what they were like in community. And that's the passage that we read. So it begs the question, what would Christian communities be like when they're empowered? by the Spirit. Well, Luke gives us a detailed description. Now, my friend and one of my wonderful mentors, Dr. Kent Hughes, likes to think of analyzing this paragraph with the question, when the Spirit reigns, then fill in the blank. The testimony of what believers are like when the Spirit reigns. And it's a beautiful testimony of what God calls the church to be and to do. Now, the first lesson that we learn from this, which is absolutely awesome, is the fact that God does not leave us alone to fulfill this mission by our own strength and by our own creativity and our own ways of doing things. But rather, he empowers us to be and to do all that God requires of us. We're not alone. Because after all, this really isn't our mission at all, is it? It's his and he has invited us along. He has included us and empowered us to, to be a part of what he is doing. Now, how amazing is that? What could be so amazing than to be a partner with the one almighty God in what he's accomplishing in the world? And I will tell you, friends, that one of the many reasons why I love being a part of this particular church is that in many ways I see clear evidence that here the Spirit does reign in many ways. God is accomplishing tremendous things in the life and ministry of First Presbyterian Church. And it's no wonder that God keeps adding to our number. I mean, it still amazes me after having pastored itty bitty churches for about 15 years and then I came down to Florida that Several times a year when we have new member classes, there's more people attending that class than sometimes I had on a Sunday morning in my church. It is remarkable how God keeps blessing this community of faith. But at the same time, Acts 2 is also a witness to the ways in which we can do even better in serving God's purpose and ministry and perhaps from time to time when we need some repentance. But now, if you get anything out of what I have to say this morning or what I hear the scripture saying to us this morning, it's this. We have the assurance from Jesus himself of what he's going to accomplish in this church and how we need not fear. Sometimes Christians get upset or get concerned or get 
uh, despairing because sometimes in human history it is felt like that evil gets the upper hand and that is, is the lie that gets thrown around out there. Well, nobody goes to church anymore. And does the church have any influence in the world? And we fear that all the craziness that goes on in the world is overcoming the church. But if you'll remember when Peter made his famous con confession of faith, Jesus asked the disciples, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter blurts out, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus compliments him and says, well, you didn't get that from people. You got that from, from uh, the spirit. You got that from heaven. But good for you, Simon, you're no longer Simon. I call you Peter. You're a rock because the rock of your confession, this principle, this teaching, this truth that I am the Christ, the son of the living God, upon that, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. All the way back then, Jesus assured us that evil will not prevail over the church. But the church will be victorious because Christ is victorious. And even though many have tried to destroy the church, and some are still trying, they have failed and will fail as long as our witness remains the same as Peter's. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Because the apostle Paul warned us that there would be those who would preach a different gospel. Now, face it, people can believe whatever they want to, but don't call it Christianity if it is not consistent with the apostolic witness. God will not bless that. And the extent to which we depart from the apostolic witness is the extent to which we stifle the growth of the kingdom. We're fighting against something that we will lose because Christ has already won the victory and will assure the victory, as we just sang in our opening hymn. It has been said that God does his work through the church and there is no plan B. So we are called, not in a self-serving way, we are called to love the church because Jesus loved the church so much that he gave his life for her. Our view of salvation must not solely be fixed on individual salvation. It certainly includes that. And each one of us individually celebrates that and praises God for that. But salvation is also for his body, for all of us together, which is also what we sang in our opening hymn. So what does this church, this community look like where the spirit reigns? Well, there are four things. So the first, where the spirit reigns, believers are devoted to the word of God. That's the first thing that's listed because that is what upon which everything else is based. So what, so what does uh, Luke say about this? Verses 42 and 43. And they devoted themselves, and some translations really get to the heart of the Greek by adding the word continually. <laughs> it's not just spotty every now and then have an association with it. They devoted themselves continually uh, to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Now, this is the importance of the apostolic authority. Why have I already mentioned it? Why do I emphasize it so much? It's because the apostles, the original 12 minus Judas and Matthias, the original 12 were the ones who heard everything that Jesus taught they're the ones who saw everything that Jesus did. And they're the ones who told everybody else. They're the ones who had the real story. And this is recorded for us in the scripture. And all the books of the New Testament that record this, the standard, why, why were those books included? They either had to be written by one of the apostles, by one of the apostles' disciples, or certainly consistent with the apostolic teaching. Otherwise, that, that writing would never have gotten in the New Testament. So for us, the apostolic authority, the apostles' teaching is the Bible. 
It reveals to us their testimony. Now, once again, I praise God by how much this congregation's devotion to studying to God's word can always be improved, but how God, you know, the studying of God's word has deepened through the years. Many of you who have attended the great banquet, we have the dig classes, we have Allen's Monday class, we have Tuesday class, we have Friday morning class. The youth ministry is teaching the gospel to the children. And there are so many other uh, small groups and ministries, men's and women's ministry. The bookstore claims that they're selling Bibles by uh, boatloads of Bibles. People are coming in, they want a Bible. There's special events, private study, and the demand of the elders and the congregation for biblical preaching. Because you see, when the Spirit reigns, there is a relentless hunger for the Word, for the truth. Because the Word determines the character of our fellowship. It defines the meaning of the sacraments that we celebrate. Just as they talked about breaking bread there in the passage. It informs our prayer life and inspires our prayer life. And it teaches us to see the hand of God, the, the amazing things that he's doing all around us and to give credit where credit is due. Now friends, this might be one area where perhaps we could do a better job. It says that the, an awe came upon the people because of what they were seeing the apostles do. And you know what? God is doing amazing things in your lives. And we need more opportunities for people to be able to share with the rest of us what God is doing. Because when we hear the miracles that go on, when we hear the encouragement, the amazing things that God is making happen, that encourages the rest of us. It deepens our faith. It gives us hope. It lifts, uplifts our hearts, the various testimonies that we could have. So that spirit of awe can come over us. Now let's face it, we have, we, we've experienced awe. If you were here on Easter Sunday and the choir's belting out the hallelujah chorus, right? And everybody's going, wow, the majesty of Almighty God. But this goes on all the time. And when we lose touch with that, it's very easy to start losing heart. But it comes from the word of God. And so Paul instructed Timothy, this is another one of those famous 316s. You know, we have John 316. 2 Timothy 3.16, it's another good memory verse. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the servant of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So that's the first one. The, where the spirit reigns, they're devoted to the word of God. Second, where the Spirit reigns, believers bond in community. How we relate to one another is a witness to the love of Christ. When Christians are at enmity with each other, when there's those good old church fights, again, in the opening hymn, it talked about schisms and all that kind of stuff. When, when unbelievers see that, what kind of witness is that? They look at us and say, why should I... Fool with you people. You don't get along just as well as anybody else does. What's different about you? What's different about you? There's another song we sing is they will know we are Christians by our love. And though we might not agree, we agree on absolutely everything, look what it says here in, um, in Acts 2, verses 44 and 45. And all who believed were together and had all things in common and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now, be aware that that description is not a blueprint for a comprehensive economic system for a society because you will notice that this is not coerced, this is not obligatory, but what it is is the sharing is a free flowing from their hearts because they understood that this agape love, this uh, self-sacrificing, unconditional love goes this way. And so they recognize that when any part of the body of Christ hurts, er the whole body hurts. It's the community of faith's issue. Jack Miller, Pastor Jack Miller once said, as we contemplate the one that we follow and the example, the one that we say we are disciples, he says, cheer up. 
You are a worse sinner than you ever dared to imagine. And you're loved more than you ever dared hope. The Bible teaches that when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Can we do less if we claim to be disciples of his? And again, my friends, I rejoice what the Holy Spirit is doing in this congregation. This congregation's seemingly natural sense of giving and generosity. How this congregation responds when you have been made aware of a need. Now, rejecting any temptation to brag, but rather in the spirit of celebration of what God has done, do you realize this congregation alone raised over $460,000 in relief funds for Ian. Well, for the people that were affected by Ian. 900 shoeboxes, hundreds of manger tree gifts, a commitment to the Immokalee Fair Housing Program. We support over 54 missionaries around the world. We've had over 1,000 Compassion International kids. Samaritan's Purse, Love Inc. We can go on and on of all the things, not to mention an $8 million budget that this church supports. As you see, when the, where the Spirit reigns, the work increases, the community enlarges, and so do his blessings. Okay, that's the second. So the word of God and community. The third thing, it's no surprise that where the spirit reigns, believers worship and honor God. Verse 46, and day by day, every day, notice that, and day by day, attending the temple together, and actually, literally, that word together means of the same mind. And breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God. Worship for them was a daily activity. And the reason why is because God was at the center of every one of their days. It wasn't just an occasional, well, I gotta go, I gotta go visit God this week. But rather, every single day, he was at the center of it. And so a spirit of worship and a desire to worship was a daily occurrence for them. And even when they received their meals, they never took it for granted that the food that they were enjoying was a gift from him. Everything centered around God. So a worshiping people are a grateful people. A worshiping people recognize the one greater than themselves. It isn't all about me. A worshiping people are a united people in their focus and their purpose, even if they don't agree on every detail, absolutely. But they're shaped by the blessed tie that binds. When I read this part about breaking bread in homes, I, you know, they go to the temple and they worship and they hear the teaching or whatever. Then they go to each other's homes. That, that, that tells me that they really loved being together. And that's what I've noticed about this congregation. You all like being together. And it's, it's more than, a, the, the worshiping community is more than just coming and enjoying the show. I mean, there's a, all a multitude of blessings when you come for worship. Don't, don't we know it? But it doesn't end there. It's a community of faith. And that's why we have a, a fellowship time afterwards so that we can spend time together. We can be together. And I remember when the whole COVID thing started to wind down and more and more people started coming back to worship, I moved as much as possible. I tried to be at the front door as people came in, especially people we haven't, hadn't seen for a while. And I would greet them with, welcome home. And I can't tell you the number of people that responded sincerely, if even few tears in their eyes, saying, yes, it feels like I've come home. The body of Christ loves to be together because the love of Christ spills out from us to one another. But there's another dimension to this. Worshiping people recognize that it's not only the local worshiping people that we're talking about. There is awareness of brothers and sisters around the world. The church when we talk about the church, we're not just talking about the 3,000 or so that are associated with First Press. The church constitutes 
billions of brothers and sisters around the world that we are all part of the same church. And many of those folks are under persecution even today. And we must never allow them out of our minds and out of our hearts. And we must pray for them. Because of their sacrifice, how many will hear the gospel and be saved? This phrase, the Holy Catholic Church, that we mentioned in the, the Apostles' Creed, meaning the, the Holy Universal, the, the whole church, is more than just a creedal statement. It's a living reality that shapes our prayers and our sense of common mission and brotherhood and sisterhood. Have you ever been to a foreign country? And you're, you're there and everybody's speaking a different language, they have different customs, and you feel like the odd person out. And then all of a sudden, off in the distance, you hear some guy say, well, you know where I could find a taxi cab to take me back to my hotel? And all of a sudden you go, an American. And there's an immediate bond. Or if you're, if you're out at even in a, uh, another city in America, and like in my case, I'm a St. Louis Cardinal fan, which is not a, the best thing to be right now. But, and you look over and there's a guy with a cardinal hat. Immediate a, a bond. <laughs> you have something in common. And you go over to that person and say, hey, go cardinals. You know, now you've got something in common. That's the way it should be with Christians. You meet somebody, you don't speak their language. They look different. They act different. But you find out they're a Christian. And all of a sudden, you see family. Doesn't make any difference what culture or dress they have. This is one of the joys of those of you who have gone with me to Israel. People from all over the world want to come there for the same reason we're there, for a pilgrimage. And I have met people from Europe, from Nigeria, from India. As a matter of fact, just yesterday I received an email from a pastor in India that I met on one of our Israel trips and we've kept in touch. We prayed for each other over in India he shows my picture to the, his congregation all the time. And they, these are some brothers uh, over, over in, uh, brothers and sisters over in uh, Florida. And he told me, now get this, this shouldn't matter to you. He just had a, an event, outdoor event. And, and just like this morning, it was a torrential rain. But hundreds of people came to this. And he said, uh, tens, hundreds, were baptized. They came to faith in India. And he said, please tell your congregation to pray for these people, that they remain strong in the faith and continue to pray for our ministry. That's our family. They're part of our church. What a blessing that we have them so we must widen our sense of body of Christ beyond the immediate community. Okay, so we're gonna pray for him a little bit. Finally, where the spirit reigns, believers engage with the world. Jesus did not teach us to withdraw and only associate with our own. He said, be in the world, just don't be of it. So in verse 47, it says, having favor with all the people. And the Lord, notice it's the Lord doing this, the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. If we are gonna find favor with the people outside the church, if we are gonna impact them enough to hear the gospel and choose to join us, then guess what? We need to hang out with them. We need to be able to form relationships with unbelievers. We need to not be afraid to engage with them, even those who uh, don't want anything to do with the gospel at this point. You have no idea what God's gonna do in that person's life. To genuinely love them, not thinking of them as projects, but being authentic disciples of Jesus, being who we are and loving them as our master taught. Now, there's a quote that um, is attributed to Gandhi. It's probably apocryphal, but it does make the point because Gandhi, a Hindu, while he was in England, read the New Testament and knew it very well and admired Jesus of Nazareth. But he has supposedly said, 
These Christians must be amazing people. I'd like to meet one someday. I think his point is, can you envision what the world would be like if all those billions of Christians really lived the way the master taught, really took Acts 2 seriously? And when people encounter us, what do they experience? What do they hear? What do they see? That's our call in going out into the world to make disciples, to be clear on that question. So Acts 2 testifies to us what the first Christians did and what they were like. And as a result, the Lord added daily those who were being saved. Pray for such an outbreak of the Holy Spirit among God's people that that could be said in our day. And there are places where that is happening. We just heard about what happened up at Ashbury University. And it, that revival started amongst the young people. Not the experienced, wise and older people, but the kids. And that revival swept through that student body. It's happening in places like Iran, of all places. China, throughout Africa. The Spirit is pour out, India is pouring out in places that we never thought it would. So may we resolve to take the Acts 2 church's example to heart. And may we never take it for granted that being part of the body of Christ, the church, means to be part of the most essential mission in the world. Because all the other missions of the world are temporal. We're talking about impacting eternity. And may we rejoice that God has included us in what he is doing in this troubled world. And never underestimate your own personal part in this body and in this mission. I do thank God for this church. For where the spirit reigns, there is truth. There is hope. There is blessing. And where the spirit reigns, there is strength. There is healing. There is a loving community. But best of all, where the spirit reigns, there is salvation. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we come before you in our humble ways to attempt to praise you as you deserve for just who you are and for the amazing love that you have shown us in Jesus Christ. And Father, as we come before you symbolically on our knees, praying for your blessing upon each one of us, to strengthen us in our faith, uplift us in our spirits, heal us, forgive us, all of those things. And it's a part of the human experience. We also pray, Father, that you will so empower each one of us that in our own ways, in our own walk, in our own life path, you will use us as your instruments. Help us, Lord, to trust in what you are doing. Help us to always remember our brothers and sisters all around the world, some who are giving their lives literally to death for you. And Father, this morning I especially remember my friends over in India and the powerful work you're doing through them. And for these new believers who are surrounded by Hinduism and other isms, that their faith will remain strong and that they themselves will be contagious and the spreading of the gospel. We praise you and thank you, Lord, for our good fortune that in your providence you chose to include us in this community of faith. Help us, Lord, to be worthy of that and to glorify you in all that we do. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers and we offer them in that name that is above all names, the name of Jesus our Savior and Sovereign Lord. Amen.